Well, good morning again. And praise the Lord for His Word and for His Spirit and for His love. And may that be our prayer that others would see the love of God through us. I'm so thankful to Dr. Stratton and to the entire college here for your hospitality. Again, as I said yesterday, it's, it's uh, always a delight to be on this campus and to meet you students and to be able to shake your hands and to talk to you a little bit. I've gotten to know some of your names. Uh, Justin, Jason, Dennis, Joe, Jeff, guys like that who wanted a catalog from the seminary I represent. I have a few more left, and I can get those to you back on the, the uh, table back there. I also have some other brochures and so forth. And before I get into the Word of God this morning, I would like, if uh, possible here, just to say a few things about the seminary up in Ankeny, Iowa. Faith Baptist Theological Seminary in Ankeny, Iowa is located there in a suburb of Des Moines. Ankeny is a suburb of Des Moines. Des Moines is the capital city of the state of Iowa. And because of this, there are plenty of job opportunities. If the Lord would lead you to seminary and he would then specifically lead you to faith, of course, we would be delighted to have that happen and would trust that you would have the faith and the courage to step out and go in the direction that the Lord would lead. He would provide for your needs. There are many job opportunities up there in the Des Moines area. Our seminary, to my knowledge, is one of the only, maybe the only, but one of the very, very few seminaries that is regionally accredited and that is also within the realm of Baptist fundamentalism. Uh, Clearwater here is regionally accredited. Our seminary is also regionally accredited. We have an f- outstanding faculty with uh, multiple degrees from many different places. They, are, they write, they teach. They go out on the lecture circuit, the Bible conference circuit. Several of them are also full-time pastors. Uh, Some have been church planters or missionaries and done work overseas. The Lord has certainly blessed the seminary there in Ankeny, Iowa, and we're delighted about that. So just to watch him do what he has been doing. Over the years, the seminary has also grown in enrollment. That's one of the questions that I'm often asked is, what is the size of the seminary? I suppose in total body count, uh, somewhere over 160 students right now for this school year, and that means about 80 or so with a full-time equivalency. We have the Master of Arts, three Master, uh, three Master of Arts programs, Master of Arts in Religion, and we also offer our flagship program, the three-year 96-credit Master of Divinity program. Because we are regionally accredited, if you are interested in going into the military as a chaplain, We have also been approved for chaplaincy training, if you'd like to enter any of the branches of the military, the armed services. I do think that the academics at faith is rigorous, but I also am confident that we pay attention to the needs of the heart. There's an evangelistic zeal on campus every day in chapel. Because we have a a small student body, we're able to ask if there are any prayer requests, and every day there are students who who are sharing their faith with their co-workers, and every so often we hear reports of those who have made profession of faith in Jesus Christ, and we delight in that. So we we have sought to have the fervency and uh, an earnestness in our walk with God and to couple that with the rigors of a graduate-level education. Although it's difficult to do, by the grace of God, I believe that we have accomplished that. The Word of God is at the heart of everything that we do. We take it seriously. We love it. We study it. Students and professors spend time together, not just in the classes, but over a supper table, over the lunch table. And we we delight in spending time with our students. Our seminary hymn, which, by the way, was written by your Dr. Delnay, has a little phrase in there, a fellowship of scholarship. And Dr. Delnay was the founding dean of the seminary, and he had that as part of the vision. And we have stayed true to that through the years, that there would be a camaraderie that would be unrivaled a closeness between faculty and students. And it's all about discipleship, isn't it? And we delight in that as well. So please, uh, if the Lord would have you go to seminary, I would be, I would be uh, happy to hear that. And of course, if he would lead you our way, I would even be a little bit more happy uh, beyond that too. Please come if the Lord would direct you our way. Now, let's get into the Word of God. Yesterday, we learned or we were reminded of the love of God for us. And it was my intention to show you from the book of Hosea the greatness, the vastness of God's love that we might comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, depth, height, and length of God's love, Christ's love for us as members here in this New Testament age. And building upon this comprehension of God's love, 
I would like to show you this morning from the Word of God, from the Bible, how we then ought to live our lives knowing the love of God. How ought we to respond with the lives that He has given to us? Now, this isn't rocket science. It's very simple. And to begin with, I have a little story here. It says, when NASA first started sending up astronauts, they quickly discovered that ballpoint pens would not work in zero gravity. To combat this problem, NASA scientists spent a decade and $12 million developing a pen that writes in zero gravity, upside down, on almost any surface, including glass, and at temperatures ranging from below freezing to over 300 degrees centigrade. Meanwhile, the Russians used a pencil. I think it's important for us once in a while just to get back to the basics, and the basics of yesterday and this morning are very simply, God loves us. We ought, therefore, to respond to his love. I'm reminded of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, which says, For he hath made him, Jesus Christ, God the Father made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Notice there the love of God. It is not merely that Jesus Christ our Savior, in the perfection of his humanity, not even able to sin and and not having sinned and living a life on this earth of perfection, that then he died and offered to us the perfection of humanity. The ideal for Adam. No, in the new Adam we have both God and man. And the verse said that Jesus Christ offers to us the righteousness of God. And that is the only solution to the deserved wrath of God. For all of humanity is sinful and under the judgment of a holy, righteous God, but then enters the Savior, the one who offers to us, if we would just receive it by faith, His own righteousness, which indeed is the righteousness of God. And we see, therefore, the love of God, which makes so freely available His own righteousness. We would just appropriate it by faith. And also in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that verse there, 15, and that He died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. And if yesterday the the theme or the center of the sermon was that we would comprehend the love of God, this morning the theme or the, the very center of the sermon is that we should live for God. Live unto God. What does it mean to live unto God? In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and if you have a Bible this morning, you may want to open it here because we will be looking at verses 1 through 10 this morning in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. In this chapter, we are told what it means to live for God, to truly give our lives over to Him, that we should not henceforth live unto ourselves. John Calvin said, There exists in the human mind, and indeed by natural instinct, a sense of deity. Somebody else Catapulting from that statement writes, We are born and we live for the express purpose of knowing and loving God. He is the source of our life and our hearts are restless until they come to Him. And there are plenty of Christians, maybe even including you, young person today, who you have received the grace of God. You have been forgiven of your sins. But to this point, you have received the grace of God in vain, for you are still living unto yourself and not living unto God. We read about it here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 1. We then, Paul writes, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. For he hath said, and now a quotation from Isaiah 49, 8, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored, or have I helped thee. End of quotation. Now the Pauline commentary. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And Paul quotes from the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament there from Isaiah 49. And the point that he makes is that salvation which is made available to the Gentiles, noting this in Isaiah 49, not only is salvation made available to Gentiles, to non-Jews, but salvation has always been and always will be the work of God. Salvation originates with God. 
It is God's work. It is by His initiative. And since we were saved by God's work, He is the one who helped us. He is the one who set up the time. And now with the gospel going out throughout all the world, this is the day of salvation. And we ought not to live the Christian life in vain. We who are recipients of God's grace and of His love ought not merely to be forgiven, but our lives ought to be filled and fulfilled with the purpose of having been poured out in service for Jesus Christ. This is the commandment of the Scripture this morning, that we would live unto God, not live unto self. There is a, a book called Portrait of Obedience, and in this book, it is the biography of a pastor whose name it was Bob Ketchum. He is now with the Lord. And when Bob Ketchum, who had been a pastor for many, many years before God took him home, when he first became a pastor, I think it was at the age of 23, he sat down at his pastor's desk. And this is applicable to all of us. Whether you're a Bible major or not, this verse is true. And it is, it is paramount for all of us. And we must give this attention. But this young pastor sat down in that little church there in the hills of Pennsylvania, in Roulette, Pennsylvania, and he was reading in the book of Colossians. And as he made his way through the first chapter of the epistle, his eyes stopped at verse 18. Do you know Colossians 1.18? And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And the young pastor, Pastor Ketchum, stopped there and he said to himself, there it is, there, right there, so it will be for me. Whenever there is an issue, find out where Jesus Christ stands on that issue and then stand with Him, even if I have to stand alone. If I want to be right, find out where Christ is and no matter who else passes by, let me stay there. So Pastor Ketchum pulled, out his, uh, pulled his Bible closer to himself, took out a pencil, and in the upper corner under his own name, he wrote Colossians 1.18. And then as he moved the Bible to the side of the desk, it was almost as if a voice seemed to say to him, Now, son, that isn't going to be easy. Not as easy as you think it is. And then as he began to grasp what this verse could mean in his life and where he would sometimes have to stand, panic gripped his heart. And the young pastor honestly did not know whether he wanted to go through with this commitment. So taking his Bible again, he grabbed the pencil and the pencil eraser and began to remove the reference he had just placed inside the cover of his Bible. And then he stopped himself as suddenly as he, as he had begun and forcefully closed the cover of his Bible. He moved the Bible back and said, No, sir, it's going to stay. And with tears brimming in his eyes and dripping down his cheeks, he asked himself aloud, what is this going to get me into? What is this going to cost me? And as the question still echoed in his mind, he once more fingered the eraser, but the passage haunted him. And as soon as he started to erase it, he would realize the importance of the message contained in the verse and stop. And over and over again, he told himself that he had to, he, it had to be that way. Colossians 1.18 had to be that way in Christ had to have the preeminence in all things. And so for at least an hour, he went back and forth and back and forth again and again and again, the book says. One minute he was going to erase the reference, and the next minute he was going to leave it there. Colossians 1.18 in the struggle. You can see the spiritual struggle in the life there of Bob Ketchum, but what about the spiritual struggle in your life today? Could you take a pencil in hand and write it down? Colossians 1.18 that, in the re that for all of your days, Christ would have the preeminence. But where would that lead us? Where would that take us? And you see then how that our own unbelief stands in the way. For we are weak in faith and we do not really trust the Lord with our lives. And yet this day, above, above all days of this week, He commands us from this text that we would render our lives useful only to Him. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Do you know those verses? Can we quote those together by, by memory? Let's do it. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not transformed, and be not conformed unto this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Great verses. 
the perfect will of God. He loves you. Your life belongs to Him. Verse 3 of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and we continue now, giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed. Notice how that we, we remove ourselves from the equation. The gospel is offensive enough, Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians. We don't need to add to the offense. That's why we ought not to live for self, to inject ourselves into the equation. But now in verses 4 and 5, we see what it means to live unto God. If we are to live unto God, and we must, we will do it, first of all, by enduring hardship. We live for God by enduring hardship. Verses 4 and 5. Now, just step back a little bit. If you're taking notes, verses 4 and 5, we see nine trials. Verses 6 and 7, we see nine qualities. And in verses 8 through 10, we see nine paradoxes. There are three sets of nine. And I've entitled verses 4 and 5 with the point, by enduring hardship. By enduring hardship. And there's quite a list here. It's similar to the list that we see later in 2 Corinthians in this very same epistle. But notice now, this is almost as if the Apostle Paul is sending back his resume to the believers there in Corinth. For there were many false teachers who had passed through Corinth. And they had their own letters of commendation. It says so in chapter 3, verse 1. They were rather proud of the, the accolades that they had received from others like unto themselves. One false apostle praising another false apostle. And the true apostle, Paul, he says, I don't need any letters written with ink. For I have you, Corinthian believers, you are my epistles, for the Holy Spirit has written on your hearts, and you are all the testimonial that I need, the only resume, the only curriculum vitae that I need to verify the validity of my ministry which God has given unto me. But if you seek other commendation, as it says in chapter 5, verse 12, for we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory in our behalf. If that's what you need, if you need a little bit more commendation, then here it is. Here's my resume. And on the first page, I'm going to show you all the hardships that I have endured. And if you and I, this morning, would give Christ the preeminence in everything, and if we would live unto Him, then we must do it also by enduring hardship. Verse 4, But in all things, approving ourselves, commending ourselves, here's the resume, as the ministers, the servants, the diakonoi of God, in much patience, this is with much or great endurance, in affliction, in necessities, these would be the troubles, so persevering through the troubles. And here we have these nine trials, as I work my way through them, you can even see how that they are, they are further paired with three sets of three, patience, affliction, and troubles or necessities. We have distresses, we have stripes or blows. And with the distresses, we, we read about these tight places that God puts us in. These are the, the narrow places of life when you feel like the walls are crashing in and the ceiling gives way and, and uh, it almost takes your breath away. And, but yet you know that having, having given your life over to God, living unto Him, you are right smack dab in the middle of His will for your life, even though you be in a distressing place. And the Apostle Paul certainly experienced blows. And we say often, well, we would not experience that here in America, but some of us are younger. And should the Lord delay His return for us, and should we be given length of days, there may come a day, even in America, when the price would be greater to follow the Lord. Certainly in other places around the globe, this is the case. Christians who have made Christ preeminent and are not only forgiven, but are also fulfilled. They have experienced the blows of the persecutors. Paul did. The stripes. In, also, he says, I have ministered in imprisonments, in tumults. These would be the mob actions of violence. These would be the insurrections that Paul found himself caught up in. In several cities this happened. See now the last triad. In labors. This is the kind of labor Dr. Dolnay used to teach me. He said, this is the labor where you toil to the point of fatigue. It's the idea where you get down into the ditch with the shovel and you dig and you dig. And at the end of the day of digging, the ditch collapses and you go back the next day and dig some more. That's the toil. That's the toil of ministry and of serving Jesus Christ. 
in labors, in watchings. These would be the sleepless nights. The sleepless nights of tossing and turning in prayer and getting up and turning on the lamp at the desk and reading the Word of God. These would be the sleepless nights with friends at the hospital or the suicide watch at the bedside of someone in a, in a, in a, in a psych ward at the hospital. The sleepless nights and in the fastings, the hunger. It could be a self-imposed fasting linked with prayer, but it could also be a, the kind of fasting or the hunger that comes because there's simply no food on this missionary journey. And it is imperative, young person, for you and for, for me this morning to remember that Jesus Christ loves us. And we owe Him our lives with no strings attached. And even if Christ would have the preeminence by having us endure hardship, would you commit your life to Christ today and say, I would, would, yes, I would stand up and I would be prepared to endure hardship for my life is not my own. And there are many in your generation who are making this decision in America. And may your tribe increase. But yet there are some of you who are holding back because of verses like these And you would seek to live your own life of ease. And I stand before you this morning and I tell you that serving Jesus Christ is not about breakfast in bed. It is not about a foot massage at the end of a busy day. It is hardship. It is hardship. But what a a fulfilling life it is to serve Jesus Christ. And some of you have longed for this for days, for purpose and direction. And now you must make the decision to make Christ preeminent in all things. We do it by enduring hardship, but secondly, we do it by excluding self. We do it by excluding self. Remember what it said back in chapter 5, that they which live unto themselves, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. We, We would give Christ the preeminence in our lives by excluding self. We see this now in verses 6 and 7. And again, a list of nine, but instead of having three triads... Note here that we have four groups of two, so we have four couplings, and then we have a ninth tacked on at the very end. Verses 6 and 7. I do not see self anywhere in these verses. I'm not looking out for self in verses 6 and 7. I'm not living, striving for the, in my, in my vocation, I'm not living or striving for the chief pulpit. If it, if it opened and the Lord directed, then receive it with grace. But that is not what I strive for. What are you studying? To be a businessman, to be a teacher, to be a pastor, a missionary, to be a musician. Set goals, but make sure that you have died to self. And whatever, whatever the, the commendations may be that come from man, receive them with grace, but do not live for them. Live solely for Christ. See, with me, verses 6 and 7. By pureness, this is sincerity. No duplicity. Not living for self. By knowledge, knowing Christ and Him alone. By long-suffering, this is the long-tempered individual who does not put his ego in the way of his work. By kindness, the softness of Christ manifest in the life of the believer. By the Holy Ghost, the strength and power of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth and the Spirit of holiness, by love unfeigned, genuine love. And genuine love is altruistic. It's a love that thinks and purposes only the good of the other. Does not have, as I said earlier, does not have any strings attached. There is no hidden agenda, but true, genuine love. And that's how God loved us. Remember yesterday from Hosea, and this is how He expects us to love. Not selfishly, but selflessly. And so we must exclude self. Verse 7, by the word of truth, not injecting my own thoughts into the matter, but by living by the word of truth, the word of God. And the Greek here, the prepositions are all in or within the realm of. So, living within the realm of truth, living within the realm of the power of God, not my own strength. Did you know that if you live your life and your strength, you will produce only that which you can produce? And maybe to the the human eye, to the natural eye, you may produce things that appear to be great, but to God, who sees the unseen, you have merely produced what a man or a woman can produce. Is that what you want for your life? Or would you rather have a life that is, 
that is empowered by God so that what is produced is produced by His strength and His power alone for His glory in or by the power of God and now a change in preposition all of this in, 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 in all the way through verses 4, 5, 6 and 7a and finally we have a change in the preposition it's translated by the armor of righteousness but it means through the armor of righteousness by means of doing all of these things selflessly and now trusting in the protection of God and in the protection of His righteousness alone on the right hand and on the left, everywhere clothed in the righteousness of Christ and trusting in this. You see, you see, young person, you and I, because of our old sin nature and our fleshly impulses, we we thirst, not after righteousness, but we thirst for the praises of men. To have... In my vocation to have my name on the marquee in front of the biggest church parking lot. I'm not just a seminary dean. I'm also a a pastor, as Mr. Trainer introduced me yesterday. And by the way, he too is coming up to Ankeny, Iowa. I think that's common knowledge. Several of you asked him, is that where he's going? And we're delighted about that. Sorry, sir. (laughs) But I, I tell you, I struggle in this area. Living for self versus living for Christ and as a pastor, as a pastor, there's always the temptation to have your name on that big marquee, to have the primary pulpit. And whatever your vocation may be, you know the temptation, don't you? To live for self. We live for the compliments of others. Someone uh, said, uh, quote, somebody complimented me on my driving today. I found a note on my windshield that read, parking, fine. And uh, we'll live for these compliments. Although sometimes they'll come back to haunt us or to bite us, you see. We must be careful that we live only for the compliments of Jesus Christ. And that brings us to my third point this morning. Verses 9 and 10. 8, 9 and 10. If we are to live unto God and if Christ has had the preeminence in everything, then we do it by enduring hardship. We do it by excluding self. And we do it by, by waiting for His approval alone. By expecting His approval alone. Verses 8, 9 and 10. Notice the paradoxes. And there are nine pairs of paradoxes. You see Paul's ministry now, the third page of his resume. He has shown us his experience. He has shown us his his, uh, methodology or his motivation for ministry. And now he shows us his list of references. He says, if you call these people up, some will tell you that I'm shameful. Others will tell you that I'm a man of honor. Some will tell you that, some will give you an evil report. Others will give you a good report. Some will tell you that I'm a deceiver and others will say that I am yet truthful. And that's how the paradoxes begin. We pick it up in verse 8. Through, through, or by means of, honor, that is glory, and dishonor, that is shame. By an evil report, that is insult or slander, and by a good report. Some people have a few things good to say, but actually the only one who really matters is God. A good report with God. As deceivers to some and yet truthful. As unknown, disregarded, and yet well-known. Paul could say, I am, I am rarely, if ever, on the front page of the paper, and if I am on the front page, it's because of the tumults, the mob violence. I'm way in the back. As unknown and yet well-known, somebody else has written, the apostles did not receive recognition in the world of their day because the world, its literature, its politics and scholarship took no notice of them. They were not the source of daily conversation and were not sought out as the great orators. And yet they changed the world. God threw them as unknown and yet well-known, as dying. The idea there is at death's door. And many times Paul was under sentence of death. And behold, he says, we live, for we live in Christ. And Christ certainly uh, brought them He and other apostles to the point of death, to be sure, but he also rescued them as chastened. And here the word means beaten and not killed. Some would translate it as scourged or as whipped and not killed. Beaten and experiencing in his body the marks of the Lord Jesus. And in verse 10, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, constantly being glad, as grieving, yet glad, as pained, and yet glad, as poor, destitute, and yet making many rich, for he found the treasures that are hidden 
in Jesus Christ alone. Poor in this world's goods, but having everything in Christ. Poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. This is the text of the morning. And in a moment I will finish reading this account here of the pastor, Bob Ketchum, who is penciling in Colossians 1.18 into his Bible and struggles with pencil and struggles with eraser in hand. And I, I just bring it to a close this morning by asking you, and I, I understand that this kind of preaching isn't always popular and it sets us on edge at times, but we must hear it this morning. Will Christ have the preeminence in everything? Will we live unto God? And if so, are we prepared to endure hardship? Are you? Are you prepared to endure hardship? Are you, are you excluding self and dying to self daily and taking up your cross and following Christ? And do you, do you live solely for the approval of God, not for the approval of men? For they do not understand the work of God in your life. And their write-up would be paradoxical and contrary to that which God would say if you would live only for Him. Make the decision today to give your life to Christ for all your days and serve Him sacrificially. So we see this pastor catch him in his office. And as the struggle between the Lord and His servant raged, Bob's mind hearkened back to that earlier hour when he had promised the Lord that He would be given the preeminence in his life. Yet ever since that time, he had done nothing but argue with God about his decision. It was time for him to make up his mind, leave it or take it away. Whatever he did was going to be final. If he did not want it, all he had to do was erase that reference from his Bible. But he knew that if he did so, he could never pretend that he was living as God wanted him. He did not want that for his life. More than anything else, Bob wanted to be faithful and an obedient servant. So he took his Bible once more. And this time he took his pen from its holder, and with a firm hand traced over the pencil, Colossians 1, 18, with ink. And he turned the Bible kitty corner and stared resolutely at the words he had just traced. And then diagonally, down in the lower right-hand corner of the flyleaf, he wrote these words. Now, Lord, hold me to it. And then he boldly stroked his signature, Robert Thomas catch him. Will you make that decision today? Because if you will, it will be my prayer for you that God will hold you to it. That henceforth you should not live unto yourself, but unto Him which died for you and rose again. We're going to stand at this time, if that's okay, and we're going to sing a chorus. The chorus I think you know well, I have decided to follow Jesus. Let's stand and sing. And then we'll be dismissed in prayer. I'll ask the, our president here if he would please close in prayer. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the wonderful Savior that we have. And I pray that each of us today will renew our desire to follow after you. Holy Spirit, would you... Use your searchlight to point out those areas in our lives that, that we need to correct. We need to change. Lord, I pray that we will be faithful disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for your word. Thank you for its power. Now help us to do what we've heard. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.